Ann Sara, former director of Common Ground Education and Travel and longtime advocate for social justice, including normal U.S. Cuba relations. I'm speaking to you from Havana today, where I spend part of the year. In this, the second year of COVID-19 and the 62nd year of the U.S. embargo, we thought it was important for as many people in the U.S. as possible to hear directly from people in Cuba how COVID-19 and the U.S. embargo are affecting them. Massachusetts Peace Action, that stalwart organizing center for all matters promoting peace and justice in Cambridge since 1989 is serving as host. The Center for Cuban Studies on whose board I serve and also a stalwart bulwark since 1972 of information and activity and trips related to Cuba Cuban art, Cuba travel, and Cuban connection is co-sponsoring, as is the Latin American Solidarity Coalition of Western Massachusetts, which I call my other home, and then my organization too. We are grateful to our co-sponsors around the country and in Canada for their endorsement and support. You've seen their names on the screen. We will post them again, and we actually will send you all of them and the links so that you can get involved with them or find out more information as you choose. While the Biden administration so far has shown no more humanity towards Cuba than the previous administrations and does nothing to lift the boot off Cuba's neck, oblivious to the hardships caused by its sanctions as well as by COVID-19, the US people are interested, you are interested, over the next five weeks, our speakers, Cubans deeply immersed in the life challenges and opportunities of their country, will make a short presentation in their field. This will be economics, science, the arts, sociology and feminism, and the next generation. We will then open it up to your questions. The discussion will be moderated by Gloria Caballero, originally from Cuba and representing the Latin American Solidarity Coalition of Western Massachusetts, and Sandra Levinson, Executive Director of the Center for Cuban Studies. Please pose your questions in the chat. Our moderators will pose them to our speaker, or in some cases, call on you directly. If you are called on to speak, we ask that you limit yourself to one and a half minutes and direct yourself to questions to the speaker. Regretfully, Esteban Morales is ill, not so ill that we have to worry about him, but he couldn't make it tonight and he cannot join us. So we are really grateful to Ricardo Torres, another leading Cuban economist who has agreed to step in. We've posted his biography on the screen and you will learn more about him as we continue. I wanna start us out by asking Ricardo a question. And then I'm going to turn my screen over to him. Ricardo, Ricardo, you who live in Cuba and have studied Cuba extensively, how do you see what's been going on in this year of COVID-19 and embargo? What has it meant in terms of the Cuban economy and the Cuban people? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? How do you think the country is facing things? And what are the new changes that have happened? Now, I'm going to get out of my seat and turn the screen absolutely over to you. Thank you. OK, very well. Good evening, everyone. Um, um, I'm not even close to Esteban Morales in terms of the quality of, 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 of our academic work. Esteban Morales himself was a professor of mine at the university. So it's really, it's with a great pleasure that I accepted the invitation to speak to you tonight. Um, let me now take on the, some of the questions that have been uh, uh, posed to me. Well, um, I think it, it's important to, to understand that um, uh, Cuba's economy was already facing many challenges before the COVID-19 uh, started. Um, so it's been 
almost three years since we, so there, there were, or there have been some reasons behind uh, our quite a poor economic performance uh, in the last uh, few years. And so, you know, part of that has to do with, um, and, you know, several rounds of US sanctions that were introduced under the Trump administration. Uh, part of that is some of the shortcomings of uh, economic reforms in, in, in Cuba. The truth is that, uh, again, our economy was already facing many challenges before COVID-19 uh, hit Cuba in early uh, 2020, as you know, it happened to every other country in the, in the world. Um, now, what does it what has mean, meant uh, you know, COVID-19 to Cuba in terms of our, the impact on our economy and, 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 and people's lives. You know, first of all, uh, bear in mind that uh, Cuba is a country that is quite dependent on, on international tourism. You know, tourism, you know, since the early 90s became one of the key industries in Cuba. Uh, and definitely authorities were counting on, you know, millions of visitors as part of, a, a, of the country's uh, foreign revenues. Uh, it didn't happen, you know, our borders were closed in late March. So for the, 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 the you know, the, the whole year, uh, we got a reduction of more than 75% in the number of visitors to the country. Now that's one important uh, problem. And, and a second uh, uh, problem that in part is connected definitely to the United States is, you know, all the actions taken by the previous administrations in terms of remittances at the time when COVID-19 was uh, hitting the country meant that there was also a reduction from, 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 from that flow of, of, of money into, into Cuba. In this case, you can understand very, very easily that it not only affects the government itself, it also, it also affects directly the Cuban people, the families that get that money and use that money to meet some of their uh, basic needs. Then, you know, a third aspect that you have to take into account is, you know, all of the disruption that COVID-19 has uh, introduced in global trade, that has also affected Cuba. And um, Cuba is, 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 is an open economy, small economy, very dependent on foreign trade. So, you know, that disruption has disproportionately affect, uh, affected Cuba. Um, and then you can think of some of the main products that Cuba sells overseas. Their demand has been hit by the, by the pandemic. You know, think of rum, cigars, a, a few other things. So it's almost like a, we, 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 these days we want to call it even like a perfect storm. Uh, everything that could go wrong went wrong last year when it came to uh, the prospects for the economy. Um, now, in terms of people's lives, uh, I think we have two different pictures here. One is more the daily life in terms of how people uh, uh, have access to food and other uh, products. And the other thing is, is how Cuba has dealt with the pandemic. You know, in, in, in terms of daily life, it is true that you know, we, 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 uh, we've seen levels of scarcity not seen since the early 90s. And, you know, and that goes from food to, to you, know, you know, everything essentially that you need for your daily life. Um, and, you know, you, you know, there is a, this is discussion about, you know, this almost uh, endless queues in front of every store in the country. What does it mean in terms of, uh, of, of the lives? You know, what does it mean in terms of the availability of those products for, uh, for people? No, it, it, it's really true. I mean, you, you go to essentially any store and you'll see a line in front of it. People queue to, 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 to access, you know, essentially every item. Now, the, the important thing uh, is that however bad the situation is, I would say that it's not comparable to what we endure in the early 90s. Uh, you know, I, I'm in Cuba, I'm talking to you from Havana. I, I've got family in other provinces in, in, in the country. Again, it is bad enough to be worried. It is bad enough to, to prompt action, action from families, from the government, but it, this is not comparable to what we had in the early 90s. I was a kid, but then 
but I have a fresh memory of the situation uh, in the, of those years. Not comparable. Um, it's a lot more stable, and you know, even food is a, the source of a heated discussion in Cuba these days. Uh, you know, most time you go to you know those uh, um, agricultural markets, and you are able to get some vegetables, some roots. Uh, so again, uh, we're still uh, uh, far from the situation that we had in, in the early 90s, but it's serious enough to be concerned. And I think this is part of the reason why the government has been uh, somehow introducing step-by-step step some new actions. Some of them, by the way, were already uh, uh, admitted as, as, as part of the reform when the government, when the party congress, the seventh party congress uh, uh, adopted some documents, political documents back in 2016. Um, truth is that uh, some of us have been very frustrated with the slow pace of, of some of those uh, reforms. But since last year, we, we've seen a change in that. Uh, uh, and, and you know, in July, there was this kind of a famous speech by the president himself, essentially uh, mentioning several steps that will be taken you know, in, the, in the coming months to address the situation and also to uh, uh, fast forward uh, the reform. With the eye on, you know, uh, on, the, on, the, on the eighth party Congress that is due to happen in, in less than a week in, 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 in Havana. Now, on the other hand, you know, I've talked to many people, you know, around the world, and you know, they're always amazed in terms of uh, uh, Cuban numbers when it comes to the COVID-19. Uh, even in this year, where the numbers, you know, the, the, the rate of infections have gone, you know, has gone up, even, if, you know, when you, when you compare those numbers with all the countries, you know, all the Latin American countries, you know, Cuba appears in the region, Cuba is still very safe, you know, those numbers are pretty low by international standards. Um, frankly speaking, myself, I didn't have any doubt about the capacity of the Cuban uh, public health system to deal with the pandemic in a in a, in a successful way. Uh, I was more concerned about the availability of resources to deal with the pandemic if numbers uh, were to go beyond some, uh, some limits, some thresholds. Fortunately, that hasn't happened. Our authorities are rightly concerned about the recent spike in the number of, uh, of infections. But again, interna you know, by international standards, uh, we are still pretty fine, I have to say. Now, people do uh, comment and do complain sometimes about conditions in, in some, uh, uh, you know, hospitals and clinics and uh, um, um, some places. That's okay. You know, Cuba is, is a poor country. Everything is in, in short supply these, these days. But again, even considering, you know, the, the, the limited amount of resources that Cuba has at, at, at its disposal, um, We've, we've done it quite well uh, in dealing with the pandemic. And uh, 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 not least important, Kiva is producing its own vaccines. We have five candidates in, 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 in different uh, phases, clinical trials. And you know, two of them are already in phase three. And there are, there are intervention studies uh, uh, program for Havana and for Santiago de Cuba to start like what will be the mass vaccine immunization program. So the government hopes by, that by the end of the summer, you know, Cuba, well, throughout the year, so is summer, but uh, you know, by the end of August, most of Cubans will be uh, uh, vaccinated with uh, Cuban uh, vaccines. Um, those are good news. That even hopes that we are able to export, to market some of those uh, vaccines in, in, you know, to other countries in, in other nations. Um, um, you know, as, as I said, um, there are many challenges currently. I think um, Cuban citizens are watching closely, uh, uh, or, you know, looking forward to the outcome of the next uh, party Congress. You know, most of, of, of us, uh, we expect uh, uh, in a way, the government to accelerate the pace of, of, of some reforms. There have been some in interesting changes in, in the last uh, half year or so. 
I can mention, you know, for instance, uh, the private sector and cooperatives, you know, getting access to foreign trade. Uh, the government introduced or implemented the long overdue and so-called monetary and exchange rate uh, reform, Tarea Ordenamiento. Uh, well, there's been a lot of, uh, com, you know, um, comments on, on that, even criticism. The truth is that uh, we, at least I give the government credit for taking such a step uh, at these, you know, uh, difficult uh, times. And the government also indicated in early this year that they wanted to expand the room for the Cuenta Propistas, he was de facto the private sector, you know, to enter all the areas of the economy and also to make the process of, you know, getting the license easier for applicants, for entrepreneurs. Uh, we don't have the final details yet. Uh, and definitely there's been some discussion about whose activities will be permanently prohibited, uh, the so-called negative list. Um, but um, th th that is definitely a very good news. I mean, um, long looked forward by, by, uh, by most Cubans. And I think we will see some more news later this year. Uh, maybe the implementation, the full implementation of, uh, of uh, small and medium enterprises, cooperatives as well. Let us not forget about cooperatives. And, and we'll see. I think, uh, again, the situation is challenging. There is no way to hide that. Uh, but uh, I think reform has gained momentum. And, and I hope uh, more momentum definitely comes out of this, uh, in, uh, you know, um, uh, coming Congress. So I think this will be all for now. And I look forward to your questions. Uh, please, uh, please feel free to uh, address them all. Thank you. Member of the Latin American Solidarity Coalition. And before we start, I would like to spend a statement with a quick recovery. And Gloria, you, Gloria, your sound is bad like it was before. Uh, I don't know what's happening. I mean, maybe it was just a tiny bit better. We could kind of understand you, but. Is it better now? No. No? Well, a little bit. Say some more. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's try. Let's try it now. I guess so. Okay, so I would say we have just bringing everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We would like to, before we begin the round of you know, of questions. My name is Gloria Caballero. I'm a member of the Latin American Solidarity Coalition. And uh, from here, we would like to send Esteban, you know, a quick recovery and thank uh, Ricardo for taking over. Thanks everyone. So we have um, some questions already and I've been taking notes. It's been in you know, a very um, quick pace, but Ricardo, um, people are asking about um, what are the proposed reforms that the government is working on, if you could comment on it, on it and um, give some examples, for instance, and how are the people doing in Cuba? What's the morale on the ground? And, uh, and um, talk a little bit about the current restrictions. Um. Well, okay, uh, let me take on the first question. Um, as I said, you know, uh, uh, a, a big part of the discussion in Cuba in terms of the reforms in the last, uh, let's say two or three years, even from the last party Congress, have been around, uh, you know, the expansion of the, you know, the domestic private sector, cooperative, reforms to state companies and of course monetary uh, reform and, and, and also foreign investments. Uh, I would say those are like those being like the main the main topics. As I said, the government already took action on, on, on about you know around some of them. It announced a further flexibilization of 
uh, the framework for contrapropistas to, to operate in, in the economy. And uh, you know, some things have been done in terms of Cuba's uh, state companies. But, uh, and, but definitely, you know, like uh, for this year, I, 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 I think uh, there are a few topics that will get a lot of attention. Uh, one is, what is the final, you know, what is, you know, in terms of uh, what's the final decision in, uh, around uh, the expansion of Quentablopismo? You know, how does this uh, Quentablopismo changes relate to the, you know, uh, in terms of uh, small and medium enterprises? What does it mean for the economy? What will be the status of truly autonomous workers in Cuba's economy in the future? You know, I think th those are things that are being debated uh, right now in, in, in Cuba. A second topic that I already mentioned is cooperatives. You know, you know um, somehow in, in a, even it's ironic that being a socialist country, uh, cooperatives have received uh, little attention in the in the last few years, and, and you know many people are um, think, uh, well, that's not uh, that's not right. We need to, even though you know some of us believe that cooperatives are not the solution to every problem we have in the productive sector. We do believe there is a role to play uh, uh, for them in Cuba's economy. So. We would like to hear more about that in the coming months and years. Uh, a third aspect uh, is uh, foreign investment. You know, so far, you know, the government even uh, um, mentioned uh, some targets, uh, quantitative targets in terms of the amount of foreign capital that it wants to attract. We've uh, fell short of all of those targets during the, the past few years. So I think now there is a more critical assessment from the government in terms of what do we need to do in terms of getting there? And especially what kind of foreign capital we want in Kiva? You know, what, what's the role we want for foreign capital? It's a, it's a double-edged sword, I have to say. So we've got to be careful about that. So I think that's a reflection, that's a debate that is taking place right now. Fourth uh, uh, um, aspect that I also mentioned, and in my opinion, by the way, this is critical for any progress that we may achieve in the, in the coming years, how to reform Cuba's state companies. How do we deal with widespread inefficiency and, 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 and low productivity there? It's a massive sector, uh, you know, state companies are dominant everywhere, it's essentially in every industry in, in, in Cuba, from tourism to uh, 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 agriculture to biotech, everywhere, the state companies are, are dominant. So that's why it's such an important question, you know. It's not, it's, it's not only about doing something on, on, on the state companies, it's, it's, it's more about doing the right thing at the right time in terms of, 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 of state companies. I have to say, there are many opinions on that. Some are very radical, some are more nuanced. The truth is that we do have a problem there. And we need to tackle that, pro that problem if we are to make any progress on reforms and on economic performance or, or, or overall. And, and let me mention a fifth area, which is a, uh, not exactly economic, but, but we, we also know that everything is connected when, when we talk to about a society and economy. And that is, and this is, is um, social policy in Cuba. We cannot continue having a general framework for social policies designed for a country that was very egalitarian. Cuba has changed. Whether we like it or not, that's a reality. It is a fact. They're going to change it overnight. And part of that change, change has to do with the fact that today's Cuba is, is, is a more stratified society in terms of uh, uh, incomes. Uh, and, and, and we have vulnerable groups, people that somehow have been left behind. So we need to think about it. 
Uh, universal policies are fine. They should be part of any uh, future scheme, but we need to think uh, out of the box. How can we do to tackle the needs to, uh, you know, uh, understand what's happening with, with, with some groups? I think this is, this is, uh, this will be a key ingredient for any uh, a successful uh, reform because, uh, you know, part of the big legitimacy of the revolution and, and the Cuban government comes out of its social policies. Um, you know, many people criticize Cuba's economic framework, but very few people dispute that Cuba has been, socially speaking, very successful over the last six years. And, and so we need to think about that. And we should not think about it as a complement to economic uh, reform. We have to think about it as part, as an organic part of economic reform. And so we are seeing some encouraging uh, steps. So there is a lot more discussion about inequality, uh, poverty, uh, vulnerability in you know, vulnerable groups, and so on. So I think the missing part there is how Cuba's social policy will change to take into account that new reality that is already here. And, and, and I, I think it's important that we, that we uh, address that uh, from the very beginning and not as a way just to, uh, uh, again, fix what things that could go wrong with economic reform. Um, well, I left here, so you know, looking forward to the next question. Okay, go ahead, Gloria. Yeah. Okay, so we have a person who raised their hand. It is Sandra Vincent. Sandra has a question, and we remind our audience that we have a maximum of um, you know, a minute and a half so that Ricardo can fill us in with as much information as possible. Thank you. Sandra? Gloria, we, we can't understand what you're saying. Can you hear now? Is it better? It's pretty, it's pretty bad, Gloria. Maybe Sandy can also I heard you said. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Sandra, you have a question. Please. Ricardo, can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Sandra. Um, okay, my question is this. The, we've heard that the, that getting rid of the, Cuban convertible peso, the kook, has been especially difficult on the Cuban population. And I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about what you think government plans might be to ease the situation in terms of daily prices, salaries, um, whether you think the party Congress will be taking up that question, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Uh well, I didn't want to expand on that in the first place because I knew that someone will ask about the, the tarea ordenamiento on the monetary uh, reform. So that, uh, his, this is my opportunity to say a few things. You know, first of all, let me, uh, let, let me you know, hold down the list of everything that changed, you know, all things that changed in January 1st this year. So the government phased out the Cuban convertible peso the government unified the change rate before we had several change rates. Now we only have one. Uh, unifying the change rate also meant that uh, the Cuban peso was devaluated in the public sector from one Cuban peso to one for one US dollar to 24 Cuban pesos to one US dollar. But we are also, uh, the government introduced a full reform, a full reform in, in, in state wages. And the government also cut some, what they call unnecessary subsidies and excessive subsidies. So all that meant that prices went up. And, and, and so one day we changed all that. And even though the government said that uh, they've been preparing for that moment for years, we knew that it would be a little bit chaotic. Uh, there is no way it could be. It could be. It could be different. So, of course, 
I think a, a central question uh, is whether people feel they are better off now compared to the previous situation, which touches upon some of the things that you mentioned in your, in your uh, question. Well, let me put it very simple. No monetary change can produce wealth in, on the short term. So the amount of wealth, the amount of products and services available to the given citizens, it was the same in January 1st, 2021, than in December 31st, 2020. No change in that. So I think sometimes the government put up a kind of a confusing message out there. Well, we think that some of you will be better off after this change. Wrong. No, there is no chance. Our GDP fell 11% in 2020. So we are actually producing less in 2020 than in 2019. And in 2019, we also had a decrease in GDP. So there's no way you know, in, on earth that we will be better off in 2021. Just like out of magic, you know, a magical action by the Cuban government introducing this monetary reform. So I think that's, that, that's becoming clearer now. <laughs> of course, some people feel frustrated because they thought differently. But if they had us an economist, that the answer would have been the same. No, you would not be better off. You would not be better off. As a norm, we are poorer in 2021 than we were in 2020, in 2018, even in 2018. And also the government made a forecast for 2021 in terms of GDP growth. That frankly speaking, I believe is unrealistic. They forecasted GDP to grow by between six and 7%. It's not gonna happen. They counting on, for instance, foreign visitors uh, returning to Cuba in the first quarter, the so-called high season in the country. It didn't happen and it couldn't happen because uh, there were outbreaks you know, happening you know, throughout Europe, Canada, borders remain closed in most of our main markets and Cuba itself was having a hard time yeah, dealing with the pandemic. So again, there will be an economic recovery this year, but it will be very modest at the best. It will be very modest at the best. We don't have the kind of a fiscal stimuli that you see in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, or in Japan, or in, even in other countries. We don't have that capacity. Our, 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 our you know, fiscal deficit is already very high. So, uh, a key concern for authorities, but also for normal citizens is inflation. And by that, I mean, not only the planned inflation, I mean, the government knew that the monetary reform uh, will see prices going up. We're talking about, you know, follow up inflation. And there is a real risk that we get some kind of a runaway inflation this year. I think that's the number one concern. And the reason is that the scarcity is widespread. If you are, if you are pouring more money into, into the public and there are fewer services and products available, their result, regardless what you do is prices will go up, period. Even in the United States, this is in a completely different situation. There is a big debate about the impact of the fiscal packages on, on inflation. The situation in Cuba is far worse in that regard. Uh, now, um, the right question is how the government can use this reform to establish the right incentive so that production goes up and it starts uh, going up this year. I think that's, that, that, that's the thing. And for that, what we think is that the, we will need to implement additional reforms accompanying monetary and exchange rate change. And I think that's, that's the current discussion in Kiva. What do we need to do to maximize the positive impact or the potential positive impact arising from this monetary reform? But again, I'm, I'm an economist. We are taught to be very realistic and pragmatic do not expect a miracle out of this uh, uh, monetary change, not at all. But I think it's important that it happened. It was, as I said, 
in my introduction, it is a long overdue uh, uh, step. And it will also make clearer for the government what the problems are. We've got a lot of distortions coming from the usage of two currencies and several exchange rates. At least now, the government can identify with more precision what well, you know, the problems are in these companies, in this industry, and then let's uh, think about what to do there. Uh, some of those companies may be you know, shut down. Some may be restructured, what, uh, restructured one way or the other. Uh, but that's, you know, that's the situation. And, and, and I think uh, everyone now is reckoning, you know, what are the next steps in terms of, 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 of this uh, change? That's a great question. So, okay, I look forward to more questions. Um, no, Gloria, um, we're still having trouble hearing you. Sorry, I think what you should do is join by phone. Sorry, we need a question <coughs> from the chat that he's going to answer. Yeah, it seems that there are several questions around agriculture. Of course, you know, this is very a, a very pressing issue. You know, everyone talks these days about food supplies and and give us ability to grow more food. And now that, you know, somehow we are cut off from international trade and, 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 and so on. And, you know, this, is, this has been going on for, for, for years, for decades even. And, and truth is that we haven't found a good solution to that problem. What I can tell you is that um, these days, this is, another big topic in, in Cuba, within the government and within the population. Um, and I think uh, uh, changes will go around the fact that the government needs to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, farmers and, and cooperatives are freer to market their products. They should be also freer to set up their own prices. And somehow there has to be a better balance between protecting the consumer, protecting poor uh, households, and uh, sending the right incentives, incentives to producers. Again, I'm not siding with one part of the other. I'm just saying, so far, my opinion is that we haven't you know, uh, struck the right balance when it comes to that. I think we have to, to, to fine tune our policies to make sure that producers get enough to, to cover their costs, and they feel uh, uh, happy growing more food, putting a lot more physical effort and putting more investments there. At the same time, I think there are plenty of you know, tools, instruments available to, to the government. One, to protect consumers, and, and second, maybe to intervene in some markets that are um, you know, key to every family, you know, Cuban staples, rice, beans, some kind of meat, eggs, uh, maybe two or three more. But truth is that you know, cap, prices cap are not a good idea long term. They, they are useful you know, on the short term if you want to control an extraordinary situation. But in terms of changing the incentive structure for producers, it's not a good, it's not a good idea. I mean, you know, empirical evidence is, is available to everyone that wants to know about that. And I think it's time for us to reckon that, yes, this is not a good idea long term. What can we do in terms of having a more sustainable uh, policy? And something that is also important, um, I think a good goal for the government should be like, what can we do to make sure that we make a sustainable transition to organic, uh, more environmentally friendly agriculture? less dependent on imported uh, inputs, less, less dependent on importing the stuff in general. You know, we want to feed our people. Cuba is able to grow and to produce more food, but so far our agricultural system has been unable to, to, to provide for that. We are too dependent on in, in, in imported food and there is no way we can justify that. And, I, and again, uh, part of the answer has to do with 
you know, how you deal with the real producers, and those are the farmers and the cooperatives in agriculture. We need to talk to them, and I think, you know, these days there have been several meetings uh, with farmers, uh, with uh, cooperatives, and they are, they speak up, they've spoken up, uh, you know, saying what they, what they see as wrong approach by the government, and hopefully we'll get something positive, something good out of that. Um, no, that's what I can say uh, right now in terms of the uh, in terms of agriculture. There's another question here that Ricardo's reading intently, and I'm going to repeat it. What has been possible in terms of government investment during COVID and an intensified blockade in terms of spending on public services? like education, healthcare, food subsidies, and social programs for vulnerable people? Well, um, as, you, as you may know very well, you know, resources at the disposal of the government are very limited. And are even more limited now. Uh, again, our fiscal deficit is almost out of control. It's projected to be 20% of Cuba's GDP this year. That's unsustainable. And that can trigger high inflation. So. There is, the government doesn't have room to spend more. What we can do is to spend smarter. That we can do. I think, uh, again, we need to rethink, you know, I, I mentioned this when I talked about Cuba social policies. And I think we, 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 have, to go to, we have to be more uh, specific. We have, to be, we have to have more targeted policies when it comes to social spending. You know, you know, again, as I said, it's good to have also with these universal programs, healthcare, education, and so on. But we have to pay a lot more attention to vulnerable growth. Not everyone is, should be entitled to massive subsidies. Not all Cubans need subsidies these days. And, and, and we have to make sure that the money goes to those who need the money in the first place. But also, you know, spending that money in a smart way means that at the same time, you want those guys to find a job whenever it is possible to bring more sustainability to that spending. Otherwise, is, you know, we can end up trapped in this uh, uh, setting of assistentialism. You know, well, I'm, I'm, I'm vulnerable somehow, I'm poor, so I'm entitled to get subsidy from the government. I should not do anything else myself. No, uh, uh, and, and you know, this is where it gets interesting. How do we combine that kind of social spending with a productive policy so that we invest more and you know, create more jobs as well so that people can uh, get, get access to those, to those jobs and have a decent income? Because as I said before, resources are very limited. So we've got to spend them smartly uh, these days. There is a question lurking here that I wonder if it's within your field to answer, which is about trade unions and the uh, private sector. Um, uh, can workers in the private sector join a union? Well, the answer to that is yes. Uh, the confusion we've got, and this comes out of uh, our the euphemism around the cuenta propistas is that all cuenta propistas are entitled uh, to, you know, to join a, a, a union. Problem is that within the cuenta propistas group, we have the owners and we have the employees, both. Then you have both of them in the same group and interests are completely different, as you know uh, very well. And, um, I think uh, you know my experience is that so far unions have not been very active when it comes to the cuenta propistas uh, uh, group, and and mm, well you know that in a way connects to something else, which is what is the role of unions in a new Cuba, and I think uh, there is a role for unions in a new, in a new Cuba. Uh, traditionally, mm, well, my opinion is that unions have been quite passive in Cuba, since it was a state policy to protect workers, uh, somehow there was no need 
to, to take uh, more radical actions or to be voiceful uh, in terms of uh, workers' rights. Maybe that's no longer true. Maybe uh, unions, you know, both in the state sector and in the Cuenta Propisa sector, they have to rethink their role in Cuba society in this new Cuba that is emerging. And uh, frankly speaking, sooner than later, we need to stop uh, that nonsense of inviting both the owner and the employee to join the same union. It, it doesn't make any sense. And well, for me, it makes total sense that the workers join on form a union, but uh, maybe order, the owners uh, should form something else. Uh, I don't know. But uh, yes, you know, again, that, that's something that uh, I'm sure that we'll see a lot of change in Cuba in the, in the coming years, the role of unions. Well, I'm gonna ask the last question and then we're gonna to go to actions because it's very important not only to think about what's going on in Cuba, but to think about what our responsibilities are here in the United States and in other countries. And that relates to my question, Ricardo. What difference do you think it would actually make if the embargo were to be lifted? Well, a huge difference. I mean, it's not rocket science. You don't need to be an expert. You don't need to be very smart to realize that the, the, the embargo is very impactful on, on, on Cuba's economy. It harms the Cuban people, uh, uh, the very same people that they say it is meant to protect or to defend. Um, and why is so impactful? The one, you know, two, two things. One is the U.S. Is, is the biggest economy in the world. It's the biggest market. Uh, the U.S. is the, the main trading partner, probably the second or third largest trading partner for every country in the world, also for Cuba. And then for Cuba, it's especially important because uh, Cuba is a neighboring country. If you, if, if you look at a map, uh, you know, all the, all the U.S. neighbors are big trading partners of the United States, Canada, Mexico, the Caribbean, Central America. So for Cuba, the same, you know, 90 miles away is a national partner when it comes to trade. You know, all economic models will tell you that. You don't need to, again, you don't need to make a PhD to, to, to realize that. Um, and it's, it's also important because U.S. sanctions have extraterritorial implications. The U.S. is very important in most international organizations. So very often those organizations are kind of uh, hesitant or uh, afraid of engaging with Cuba. So the impact will be massive and it will make all things a lot easier when it comes to economic reform the life of daily, uh, of the day, daily life of, of ordinary Cubans. So that's not huge because we're almost at the end of our time. And the question is, what is it that we can do to actually help take, we can't take the boot of COVID-19 off the neck of Cuba, though we sure as heck could advocate for getting some of their treatments that are so effective and also getting some of their vaccines that are gonna be cheaper. But what can we do to lift the sanctions and end the embargo? And that's the cue for Cole and Bryant to put something up on screen. which will happen any minute. But I will tell you that while they're getting that organized, here's the bottom line. What the United States needs to do is remove all restrictions on remittances to families and business in Cuba, restore a fully staffed and functioning US embassy in Cuba so that it can conduct normal, uh, consular services, including visa services. Take Cuba off the list of state sponsors of terrorism. Open up travel, interchanges, and commerce between the U.S. and Cuban people. Commit to resuming the bilateral negotiations between the United States and Cuba that were so effective during the years of the Obama-Biden administration. Now, here we have some petitions you can sign. But we also have some other things that you can do, some letters that you can sign on to. And also, uh, Global Health Partners and the Saving Lives Campaign has joined Canada and some other countries in 
beginning a campaign to purchase syringes for vaccination so that Cuba can vaccinate all its population. And guess what, folks? Once everybody gets populated, uh, vaccinated, we can go again. So this is a no-brainer for us. Uh, you could see a link there to do pledges. Cuba needs 30 million syringes to vaccinate its whole population. And the cost of syringes has gone up because guess what? There's a world, worldwide shortage. Just like there was a shortage of masks in the beginning, now there's a shortage of syringes. And we are going to try to, range as, to raise as soon as we get the proper licenses and the go-ahead from our partners, $75,000 to buy 2.5 million syringes. So now, can we also move on to the letters and the other stuff that we had for taking action, Brian and Cole? Ah, uh, apparently we're going to have to send you the link to sign, write letters to your Congress people your senators and your representatives and to President Biden. But we're really gonna ask you to do that. And we really hope that you do. We also are gonna send you links and information and all of our dozen co-sponsors which have been listed and which if there's time, I would like to read off because it's so wonderful that they have joined us. Besides Mass Peace Action, the Center for Cuban Studies, and the Latin American Solidarity Coalition of Western Massachusetts. Ah, and in the chat, you can link on the letter. You can do that while I read this list. We also have been endorsed and co-sponsored by the US-Cuba Normalization Coalition and Saving Lives Campaign, Code Pink, the Committees of Correspondence for Democracy and Socialism, Global Health Partners, which is gonna help us get syringes to Cuba, the July 26th Coalition of Boston, the Latin American Working Group, which is a premier policy advocacy group in Washington, the National Network on Cuba, which is an extensive network, please check it out, the US Peace Council, the US Women in Cuba Collaboration, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, WILF, their Cuba and Bolivarian Alliance Committee, the Solidarity Collective, formerly known as Witness for Peace, Vancouver Communities in Solidarity with Cuba, Friends of Cuba Against the U.S. Blockade, Vancouver, Greater Hartford Cuba Solidarity Committee, which together with our Western Massachusetts Coalition joined in the car caravan calling for the end of the embargo, and the Canadian Network on Cuba. We are thankful to all of our co-sponsors and we're thankful for you for joining us. This has been a wonderful turnout and we hope that you will join us next week when Luis Montero Cabrera will talk about what's been going on in Cuba in terms of science, the treatments that they've developed that if we had them, we could be saving lives and the vaccines that are now going into use my doctor told me on Monday that she had received the new single dose Soberana 2 vaccine, which is now being administered to all health workers. So thank you very much. And we will see you hopefully next Tuesday. So we're going to quit talking, but we're going to leave the Zoom open for five minutes so that you can still click on the links in the chat and take the action. So we hope you will click on those right now and fill in those forms and send off those actions. There's three actions. The first one is a petition to, to uh, Biden, Blinken, and Congress to stop to end the embargo and uh, several other related uh, changes. The second is a, a move on petition on Cuba policy. And the third is the syringes um, for Cuba campaign, which is, getting, which is getting ready to start. So if there's three actions to take, if you can just take those three actions right now, get them out of the way. But we'll also send them to you by email tomorrow.
<clears throat> so we're done with the meeting. Thank you to uh, Mary and Ricardo. We are, and to Gloria and uh, Sandra. And we're just keeping this Zoom open for a couple more minutes so that you can take the actions uh, to uh, restore relations with Cuba that we've put in the chat. And just to let people know, it is incredibly easy. Uh, if you click that link, it, it could take you less than a minute and you can send messages uh, to your member of Congress and to the Biden administration. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, this was a campaign promise of Joe Biden and uh, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris. So we believe that they are predisposed uh, to take this action, um, but they just need uh, some pressure uh, so they can feel the heat uh, a little bit uh, and, and get on to the path uh, to normal relations as soon as possible. Uh, yeah, there's so many thank you messages and we appreciate it. Just put the link again there. So it's right uh, uh, at the bottom there. Um, thanks Ricardo and Mary for posting that again. So, and thank you for everyone who's in action right now. Uh, I sent a message uh, myself. It's very easy to do uh, and it does matter. Um, uh, there's uh, a lot on, on the plate of uh, the Biden administration right now with the pandemic and the economy, uh, but he needs to know that his constituents care about U.S.-Cuba relations. Um, so the more messages that we can send uh, demanding immediate action, uh, we believe the, the quicker that they will take these important steps um, so we can get back on the path to normal relations and peace between the United States and Cuba. Okay, I think it's probably been enough time we can wrap. Uh, we will send out the, the links tomorrow so you can still keep taking the actions uh, then and you can also send them out to your friends and, and your colleagues. Thank you everyone for joining us. So till next week, we'll see you, see, next, we'll see, see you next week.